Is the future of American dating polygamy? All right, so we're going to start this off with this data set that comes from YouGov. And it was basically a survey for baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials. And let's take a quick read. Millennials are less likely to want monogamous relationship. On a scale of zero, where zero is completely monogamous and six is completely non-monogamous, what would you your ideal relationship be? And so purple, of course, is completely monogamous. And we see for baby boomers, 69%. Generation X, 53, 58%, and then millennials is down to 43%. And you can see that completely monogamous versus completely non-monogamous is basically on par. So basically for those who, who decided, half of them said that they would commit they'd ideally to one person, but the other half of them said that they were looking for a relationship that might be something more than that. And that actually brings me to Shan Booty, okay? And she is maybe one of the leading voices, if you will, in the, the polygamy dating culture. And she has a, a large following. I think she has almost 7,000, I'm sorry, 700,000 subscribers. And she's spoken with many different people. She's, she spoke with, uh, with uh, Kevin Samuels. She's really big. Books on Amazon and everything, okay? And she's in a polyamorous relationship with her husband. So I want to let you listen to a conversation between the two of them and just get a feel for the kind of relationship they have and their, their kind of views on their, their relationship. Okay, here we go. And said, a lot of millennials get into these sometime-ish relationships where they're not quite committed. They're kind of in this weird limbo gray space. And I said to that person, like, if you find yourself wanting to commit to somebody who's not making that adjustment for you, there's a billion people on this planet. Like, is no excuse to be in relationships anymore that make you feel sad or don't make you feel celebrated. Okay, so I'm gonna actually let you listen to that again because this is a really important sentence she says here. She says that in this day and age, there's, there's no reason to be in a relationship that, with someone that doesn't basically make you happy, okay? I want you to hear it again just so, so you can get this. Wanting okay? to commit to somebody who's not making that adjustment for you, there's a billion people on this planet. Like, is no excuse to be in relationships anymore that make you feel sad or don't make you feel celebrated. Me, for example, I'm gonna- Okay, so she's saying you should be in a relationship that doesn't make you feel sad and makes you feel celebrated, okay? So both of those, the two conditions are feel, feel, right? Feel sad or don't feel celebrated, right? And so this is the prevailing thinking for a great number of millennials. I, if it doesn't feel right, I, I leave, it's over, right? Of course that creates a small problem when you have kids, but we're gonna get to that later, okay? So I want you to hear the husband and kind of how he kind of deals with this logic, okay? An open relationship and that works for me and I advocate for my needs and I'm in a relationship that fits who I am. And saying that was like, boom. There is like a, a, a negative connotation on certain words, and at least in America, that spark uh, an immediate reaction or immediate assumption of what we have. Um, and open means like a lot of people take that as like- Swingers. Swingers or take that as like, Oh, you know, he's just going around, you know, having sex with whoever he wants to have sex with. But it's not, that's not, um, I guess, the greatest representation of what we got going on. Okay, so he's explaining basically that they have an open relationship. And I, I can't, I'm not really particular to the situation or the arrangement they have. But I do know that they, this was probably before they had any children. I, I think it might be when they were about to get married or, or right finish marrying or right before but this is them basically explaining how their situation is that their dating situation is and i want to i want you specifically to hear the logic he he expresses when she sees someone else that she might want to be intimate with he'll get to that in a second if you were to go out and see somebody that intrigues you who am i to tell you or to steal that from you or to take that from you because you are Shannon and you're your own person. I'm not Shannon, you know what I'm saying? I'm Jared and I'm, I'm only here to support Shannon and okay. to help her. Okay, so basically what he's saying is if she sees someone that she wants to be with, who is he to stop her from expressing herself physically with, with, with that person, right? 
So there's a lot of stuff to work through in terms of the emotion and the possessiveness and the and the jealousy and whatnot. But what's interesting is that this is kind of like a, a new standard, if you will, for people dating younger Americans in particular dating that they're considering things like like the, uh, pretty much basically volunteering to complicate their relationships basically for the sole purpose of I guess more pleasure I suppose and so you've been introduced to their relationship now I want you to listen to kind of her coaching okay so this is this is uh, her talking about basically her and I as I, I this is a video called uh, Why I Became a B Star TCH, right? And just listen, I want you to listen to her kind of reasoning and just kind of a, a feel for the way she approaches, you know, her, her emotional life, if you will, okay? So let's take a listen. The more I analyzed it, I realized there's a lot of reasons that people don't like the way somebody acted or what someone said that had nothing to do with that person's goodness and instead the other person's intentions. So for example, if I really want a yes out of you and you say no, oh, I call you a bitch. But that person was just standing up for their own boundaries and advocating for their own needs. If I really want someone to back down and they won't and they stand their ground and they stand in their truth, well, that person's a bitch rather than that person is strong and assured and confident. And when I realized the way in which this word was being misused, I decided to reclaim it. And now I am proudly a bitch. And if I- Okay, okay. so so what she's, you, I think you can follow what she's saying here, but what, what's interesting is, and I wanna let you listen to some of her protégés, if you will, some, some of her followers, I guess, because they're kind of reclaiming the, the fact that putting myself first and getting what I want out of life is, is paramount and and embrace it basically but let's listen a little bit more over here people calling me a bitch i get a little tinge of pride don't get me wrong i do check myself but the word bitch that's not going to be the trigger to get me there that's a trigger for me to be like all right so she's basically saying that she's taking the b word back and and i'm going to put my priorities first and so here we go. We're going to listen to her protégés and and the, uh, pretty much I would guess they would be her followers or people that read her book. So I want you to listen to some of the, the the way that basically these young ladies are kind of looking at their self identity. And of course, you have to consider when you go into a relationship with with some of these young ladies, what what those relationships might possibly be like. So let's listen to them explain how they're taking their power back by being a B blank TCH, okay? The experience that made my bitchy side come out was when I was feeling really unhappy last year. I was feeling as if life was living me instead of me living life. Um, I was pleasing some people in my life, had bad habits, and I constantly felt like I was contained and not living to my full potential and serving my own needs. So at that point, I was like, okay, I have to be a bitch. I have to cut out some people, cut out some habits, and start living for me. So the moment that I decided... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this next one, but I want you to basically take notice of how much of the the, the conversation the conversation is about feel how i want to feel if i don't feel a certain way and and is basically centered around i need to get my feelings or my 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 needs around my feelings satisfied and that is most important okay so let's listen to the second lady here that i was going to be a bitch was the moment where I chose to quote unquote rebel against my mother for stepping out of her terms and her conditions on how I was going to live my life. A defining moment was when I... Okay, so the second lady is basically saying that that she basically made decisions about how she's going to live her life and when her mother had took issue with that, basically she she said, "You, yeah, I'm going to do it my way and so be it, okay? We'll listen to the last, the, the third lady here, okay? And then we're going to listen to them on the back side because they have a, a, a kind of way of capping off their their uh, their thoughts, okay? I had to get a loved one out of jail during the pandemic um, because they were not able to honor some financial commitments that they had made to others. 
and that was a huge moment for me because this person is the most loving most given person I've ever known and seeing them get locked up because they've been so given and they cared about themselves last was a very scary th thing to me. Life's a bitch. Okay, so, but, you know. And that's a bitch, but bitches are good. The advice that I would give to my younger self uh, about the role that the word bitch has is not to use it to take other women down because we don't need to. We can cheer other women up with, hey bitch, you're rocking it today. The advice I would give my younger self about the word bitch is don't let it be a bad thing. Don't let it bother you because when people use those terms towards you, it's usually because you're doing something that they would never do. I would tell my younger self that being a bitch is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. It makes you happier, healthier. It gives you more peace. It gives you more joy. It helps you show up to the world as your best self every day. Okay, okay so there we go. So you've gotten a good chance to see basically the kind of thought that's, that's, that we're seeing here, right? It's that I want what's important to me and my feelings are paramount. And I'm going to act on my feelings in the way that, that basically suits me the best, okay? And this is the younger generation. So I, I would imagine the three young ladies that we're talking are probably somewhere between 22 and 30-ish. So of course, these are the young women that would be of marrying age if, if the, you know, if the stats in America suggested that people were getting married, but we don't know necessarily what their dating situations are, but we can see what kind of attitude, what kind of dispo disposition we're looking at here, right? And so I want to move on from this one because I want to, this is actually the most important, uh, the most interesting part of the, uh, uh, the, the most interesting part of this uh, video to me is, Sorry, not this one, but the most interesting is, is this conversation here where this is Shan Beauty on the left. And I think she's clearly pregnant. I, I'm guessing she's pregnant. And she's, I think this is her second child with, with her husband. And this lady on the right is one of the baby mothers of Nick Cannon. Okay. And, and they're basically talking about just kind of accepting polyamory as kind of a, a, a normal, a, a norm, right? Which is it's somewhat interesting because they're both rel I mean, they're both really beautiful women, but, and they're relatively young. I think they're both 35 or younger. I think she's on the right. She's, uh, she might be 32. The unfortunate thing, of course, is that you're not young forever. So, but we'll get to that later. Okay. I, I just want you to listen to this conversation and kind of get a feel for like what the, prevailing kind of ideal is for this polyamorous relationships and, and just kind of how how it's viewed like how the what the new norm kind of is now okay so this is them interviewing talking about dating nick cannon okay for those moments and we separate we go our separate ways so i never went into this thinking i'm gonna change the game so at that time when nick and i were really getting involved with each other i was like this is great i get a self-help self-care so self-heal but still get a connection and still be inspired and motivated at the same time at a woman of 30 years old now i'm gonna be 32. that's bananas this is all over a two-year span yeah that's pretty intense because people assume naturally i think when women are in open dynamics and consensual non-monogamy that they were coerced somehow oh yeah or that their partner essentially brainwashed them yes but i always feel so good about my decision because i chose it first yes and then i found a partner yes. who was like oh this makes the perfect sense for us to engage in this together yes okay so what they're basically saying is that it's that they they chose polyamory on their own and you know, and it was a somewhat liberating decision right we also have to remember that we're t we're looking at two mothers here these are two two mothers of 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 young children okay so so there's going to be a generation of americans that are going to be growing up seeing their mothers in polyamorous situations we of course we don't really know the effects of that what, what what that means for future generations but we do know that there are going to be a growing number of children that are see this as kind of a norm okay 
Let's listen. Just keep listening. So is Nick your primary partner? Nick is my primary partner. Yes. I'm now, I mean, during this pregnancy, I'm monogamous by choice. I'm monogamous by choice. And that's very important for me to state. But if a connection comes and it doesn't necessarily have to be sex. And I think that's what everybody always thinks is, oh my God, you guys are having one big orgy. And it's like, actually, no, it's actually quite the opposite. And it's beautiful. And it could be a form of intimacy that's not sexual. It could be deep conversations or. Okay, so what she, I, she's saying, basically, she's monogamous to Nick Cannon, which, who clearly is not monogamous with her. He's having probably sex with seven or eight different women, which of course invites the fact that, and she did, she, she uh, conveniently mentioned that if she finds someone that she has a connection with, she, she might have a relationship, even though she, she alludes to the fact that it might not be, uh, it might not be physical. I mean, take that for what you want to take it for. But this is a seven, I think seven or eight women that are basically in this kind of a situation with Nick Cannon and, and they all have children. So this is going to be like a new family norm, right? Let's keep listening. You know, these fun, random, spontaneous dates or trips. And I, I think that people are so focused on what it is that they're afraid of. And that's... Well, in truth, they're afraid of what's happening to Nick. They're afraid <laughs> of it turning into multiple children. <laughs> It's so true. And I don't blame anybody though, because it does, it looks out of this world. It looks out of the norm. So, okay, so naturally, yes. I yeah, so she, and that's enough for this one, but what she's basically saying is that, it, and it is out of the norm. I mean, the norm that has been a mother and a father and children in a nuclear family, th that norm is breaking down. And so the title, when I titled the, the video, for all of the gentlemen out there who are, you know, you're working hard, you're trying to save your money and you're getting, you're trying to get your ducks in a row. And at the end of that is either A, it might be a woman who's had one or multiple polyamorous relationships. And maybe, I, I can't imagine that these relationships end amicably all the time. There might be some, you know, some emotional trauma still lingering, right? Or... It could be the other way around. You can marry the woman and then 10 years down the road, you have two or three, eight year olds or seven, six year olds, whatever. And she says, I want to be in a polyamorous relationship. And, and what options do you have if you want to see your children? And so just like, uh, the, the lady said, it's, it kind of seems out of this world, but what is kind of suggesting is that this is the new normal that's coming. And so that is a, interesting thing to, to kind of as, a, assume in the new dynamic of dating in America, right? And so we're gonna, I want you guys to, this one, I really enjoyed this one. So I, I want you guys to see this one because this is, this one is, this one is amazing. I want you guys to see these young children. These are young children and they're gonna basically debunk and this young black dude, this young black kid, he is amazing because this lady here, she's basically trying to argue on for the merits of polyamory. And this is a 12 year old boy and he kind of sees right through it. So I, let's take a listen. Or that you don't want to play with her ever again. So is it basically this shy love hexagon or something? <laughs> Sometimes that works for people in polyamorous relationships. Like you might have three people who are all in a relationship together. But well, what if he ends up catching more feelings for her than you? Yeah, you're not good for me anymore. Me and Susie, who I met last night, which you allowed me to date. Yeah, we're leaving. Bye. That's absolutely a possibility. Okay, so you know what? Let's go back here because I want you to see, I want you to see this look. That look right there suggests almost as if She's experienced that. Hold on. Me okay. to date. Yeah. Now look down right there. Let me see if I can get it. Good for me. So I can catch it right me where and she Susie, looks. Me who I met last night, which you allowed me to. Those eyes right there. See that? That almost suggests that that happened to her. That that kind of suggested that may have been an experience that she had, and and again we're talking about this polyamory. I'm 
if you're in a situation, I mean, there's always going to be dynamics. Someone likes someone more. Someone else is, it, it does something that your boyfriend, your shared boyfriend likes a little bit more. And there's jealousy and emotions involved. And to, to not deny that is just really, is almost to deny that you're dealing with humans almost. Let's keep listening because this, this young boy is a superstar. Dates? Yeah, we're leaving. Bye. That's absolutely a possibility. Everybody is allowed to follow their heart in whatever way makes sense to them. So even though it would be painful that my partner might have stronger feelings for somebody else, I would want them to do whatever made them happiest. Okay, so I think you're kind of seeing a theme in this video and it's that it's about the feelings. It, everything is revolving around what makes you feel good in that moment. And what's unfortunate about that is that children kind of need 18 years before they grow up and so there's a lot of time for feelings to change in that 18 years and we already understand that divorce rates being what they are there are precious few fewer and fewer families that are making it to 18 intact right so there's that part of it but then also you're having polyamorous relationships some of them married some of them not and you have young children growing up in the middle of this and when feelings change, what happens? What I, I don't get to see this person anymore. Or you said this person was my auntie or my special uncle. I don't see him anymore. And that's that's a real possibility. But let, let this keep going because this kid is just amazing. All right. I guess. What made you want to date and go freaky freaky with everyone? <laughs> It wasn't like a lightning bolt from God and all of a sudden I knew, but it was like, I want to allow myself to be as close to my like authentic self as possible. Okay, say you were to get pregnant, how would you know who the father was? <laughs> um, because you're seeing all these men, how could you keep track? Would you just go to boyfriend number one? Are you the father? <laughs> Take a DNA test. Nope, okay. Boyfriend number 69,420. Are you the boyfriend? <laughs> no, okay. Well, that's all of them. Well, for me personally, if I'm going to get pregnant, it's gonna be a very intentional, purposeful okay. thing. And at that point, I would probably just wanna focus on the one person that I would wanna have a family with. Okay, so so we can see, again, when, when, when the rubber hits the road, it's back to, I wanna have one person I can depend on. And I, I just, a lot of men are getting their passports because this is just too complex. It just, it's too much. And, and I, I think about how difficult it is just dealing with one person when you're in a monogamous relationship, but to try and add this level of complexity to it just for the, for seeking out more pleasure. It just, I just, I don't know where that's going to go for, for a growing number of young people to date this way. I, I mean, I can understand like when you're young and you, you just want to have fun and everything, but even then th there's going to be the lingering emotional trauma, right? You like somebody and that person is in the other room with another woman and she is screaming in a way that he doesn't make you scream or, or he sound she makes him moan in a way that he doesn't moan for you. And, and you have to normalize that kind of emotional jealousy, if you will. I just, I don't know how that's going to play out on a wide scale. And it looks like that's the future that's coming for American dating. So when I'm seeing brothers getting their passports, man, look, I want, I, I want my wife, my children, my family, and we're going to make it, we're going to do it on our own. We're going to make it because this here, I, I, where's this going? I can't see this going in a positive direction. I, I just can't see it. I see a lot of really damaged emotional people. I, I, I just can't see this being a good thing. I, I... So with that, guys, thank you for watching the video. And, you know, <laughs> uh, Austin Hollerman says, is that bad? Get your passport. And, and yes, Jonas says, be a blue book gentleman. Like the stuff like this, man, I, it's hard to blame people, young men. You're focused on your career. You're trying to get stuff together and you want to build a family. You're running into women that are that are increasingly considering things like polyamory. I don't know if that's the best place to start a family, gentlemen. 
But anyways, with that, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment on the video, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.